so as as Joni Mitchell has was saying, we are talking about parking policy reform today. And in case this is your first time joining us, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Greenbelt Alliance. My name is Zoe Siegel, and I am the Director of Climate Resilience here at Greenbelt Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. At Greenbelt Alliance, we envision a Bay Area of healthy, thriving, resilient communities made of lands and people that are safer during climate dis disasters and recover quickly from wildfire floods and drought. A place where everyone is living with nature in new and powerful ways for generations to come. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by my colleagues, Stuart Cohen, the founder and policy advisor of Transform, and Regina Celestin Williams, the executive director of Silicon Valley at Home. I will let them, them introduce themselves a little bit later. But first, let's take a moment to uh, talk about where we're going today. I know there are a variety of levels of expertise in the audience, so I'll share a little bit about what parking minimums are and what the climate impacts can be, and then I'll pass it off to Regina to talk about how parking minimum, minimums can affect affordable housing. Then Stuart will share how you can use the Green Trip tool to calculate how much parking is really needed. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, so please put any questions you may have in the Q&A feature, and if you have comments throughout the presentation, please feel free to share them in the chat box. And just a little bit of background about myself. My background is in housing development and climate resilience. I am not a transportation planner. But parking reform is not a wonky transportation policy. It is a clear, tangible way to significantly address both our housing and climate crises. Hence why I care about it. So for those of you unfamiliar with parking policy, maybe wondering what, what are minimum parking requirements and why should cities be considering eliminating them? So parking minimums are local laws that require private developments to provide, uh, they the, the require private development projects which have businesses and both res and residences to provide at least a certain number of off street parking spaces. And these requirements are one of the significant factors shaping our cities, how they're built and how they're laid out. Minimum parking requirements can be very detrimental to our cities by filling cities with underused and underutilized parking spaces that don't really add value to the community. They can push homes and businesses farther apart, worsen the walkability of neighborhoods, raise the cost of housing, and place a costly burden on development and new businesses. By eliminating parking minimums, there will still be parking, but there will be a lot more flexibility to really decide the right size of parking. And developers will no longer be forced to build more parking than is, than is needed. And as you can see from the, this chart, the amount of parking required is significantly greater than the actual space in a gym, an average apartment, or a restaurant. You can see that minimum parking requirements really vary by different uses, but in most cases, they lead to using more space for parking than the actual occupied building space. And sometimes that is needed, but sometimes it's not yet it's always required. As an example, planners don't say how many restaurants a city must have. We let the market provide as many restaurants as people are willing to pay for. In the same fashion, we should let the market decide how much parking to provide. When we charge for parking, sorry, when we charge drivers less than the cost recovery price of a parking space, we're actually providing a subsidy for driving. And when cities provide more parking than developers are willing to provide voluntarily, the result is to subsidize the car over other travel modes. And just to be clear, we're not talking about advocating to get rid of all parking. We're just talking about making it based off of market demands. By eliminating parking minimums, it'll be the developer who decides the appropriate parking levels based on you know, what the tenants will need, the project location, therefore you know, avoiding the you know, construction and the cost of greater parking supplies than really are necessary. And right now, almost all parking is free. Most cities are planned on the assumption that parking should be free, no matter how high the cost or how small the benefits. There's almost nothing else in society that is universally free. We pay for water, housing, gasoline, just about everything else. So why is there this universal assumption that parking should be free? If cities didn't require parking, the market would only supply it when profitable, like the sale of gasoline. Although gasoline is a touchy subject right now, I know it's quite high. 
uh, there would be fewer spaces and spots would be frequently empty. The spots that were frequently empty would get redeveloped into, you know, a park or, you know, a larger, larger space could become housing or, you know, some other community benefit. And more parking means more cars on the road, which really degrades the environment by increasing air pollution and greenhouse gases. It also reduces the livability of cities and contributes to traffic. It also takes up space that really could be better serving the community while also decreases walkability. And according to the state auditor, Elaine Howell, California will fall short of meeting our 2030 goal of a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels unless emissions reductions occur at a much faster pace. She also found that transportation emissions have actually increased since 2013. Even in a scenario where there is a full vehicle electrification, we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled by at least 15% in order to meet this climate goal. This climate goal is also called SB32, and this, the 40% below 1990 levels is still doable, but it's going to take a major, major innovative changes across a wide variety of different sectors, which is going to have to include local and statewide parking reform. We simply can't meet our climate goals if we keep subsidizing and requiring parking. Across the US, transportation accounted for the largest portion of the total US greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. And in California, it's even higher at 40% with 28% of that from vehicle passenger, passenger vehicles alone. Specifically, vehicles traveling on the California state highway system alone are responsible for 89 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually, which is about 21% of all of California greenhouse gas emissions. Also, uh, reducing sprawl is something that is near and dear to Greenbelt Alliance's heart and something that we really advocate for. And by reducing parking minimums, we can incentivize and decrease the cost of housing, which will result in more housing built near transit corridors and less housing in sprawling single family neighborhoods away from transit. But a reduction in parking minimums must go hand in hand with an increase in alternate transportation strategies or transportation demand management strategies. These often include urban greening as part of bike lanes, sidewalks, the preservation of green space, which can sequester carbon dioxide by conserving ecologically valuable land and promoting development in previously developed areas. So we can both reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and sequester the existing carbon dioxide that's in the air we breathe. Urban greening transportation demand management strategies have many other benefits as well, like sidewalks can have biosoils to absorb floodwaters, bike lanes can act as fire breaks and provide the, you know, the mental health support that we've all really come to value during these last few COVID years. Another thing that we'll probably get into a little bit more later, but parking, minim parking minimum requirements are problematic because they're also really costly. The average cost for one parking space on a surface lot is $34,000. And a very conservative estimate for an underground parking space um, is 75,000 per parking space. And a 2016 study in San Jose found that parking requirements increased housing costs for renters by 17%, even for people without a car. A 2020 study found that affordable housing, in the affordable, in affordable housing, one parking space per unit increases the cost by 12.5%, and two spaces increase the cost by up to 25%. One in 10 households that rent their units in San Jose don't even own their, a car. So that's over 12,000 households in San Jose that are paying for parking that they don't use. With the cost of living and construction so high, there are significantly Significant affordability issues confronting cities in California overall. Construction parking that is not used is both wasteful and contributes to the lack of housing affordability. So now you've heard a little bit about you know, the benefits of you know, parking policy reform. Greenbelt Alliance has been working both at the local level and at the state level around the Bay Area to advocate for this issue. If you live in San Jose in particular, the city council will be voting in June. Um, and if you want to get involved, please reach out to me. And if your city has not already implemented parking policy reform, make sure that's a priority included in their housing element. If you're not involved in the housing element process in your city already, you should be. Uh, reach out to planning staff in your city or go to your city's housing, ele or housing element website, just Google your city housing element to figure out where in the process your city is. Every city has to update their housing element this year and figure out how you can get involved. Advocating for parking policy reform is a clear, tangible, 
solution that really, really needs to come out of every, every housing element this year. I'm also happy to put my email in the chat if you want to learn more about how Green Buff Alliance is taking action around the Bay Area and state level. And if you want to get involved, just reach out. So as you can see, parking minimums really are this outdated one size fits all policy that has led to a significant oversupply of off street parking. But by taking this more holistic approach than simply mandating the construction of parking, we really have an opportunity to re-envision how we plan for and accommodate new development in any growing city. When people, jobs, homes, and activities are actually located close to each other, we drive less and use energy more efficiently. And we're able to produce less greenhouse gas emissions, which also improves air quality in our neighborhoods. We can improve the quality of life for all communities with clean air, less congestion, safe streets, all by just removing minimum parking requirements and requiring transportation incentives and management programs. And with that, I will pass it off to Regina. Great, thank you, Zoe. Um, that was wonderful information. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with you all at Greenbelt Alliance. My name is Regina Celestin Williams. Um, I am the executive director at SB at Home. And I actually have been at SB at Home about five months now. It'll be, it'll be six very soon. And prior to that, I worked for seven years with First Community Housing a nonprofit affordable housing developer here in the South Bay. And so today I'm going to be sharing with you all two perspectives um, very clearly. One, as a former affordable housing developer and the challenges of um, meeting the needs of the housing crisis and, and creating a place where we can all live and thrive um, through building more housing and preserving more housing uh, at, from the perspective of, of uh, parking requirements. And then the second perspective that I'd like to share is as a, a advocate for more housing and especially more affordable housing and really challenging um, the public and our elected officials and our city and county staff to adopt stronger public policy around housing and, um, and parking requirements. So uh, hoping to lend a couple of different perspectives here. Um, so as a, as a, a affordable housing developer, um, one of the things that you know, became very clear is that concept that Zoe just shared about um, building homes for people and not cars. And so at when I was at First Community Housing, we became very passionate about advocating for more homes for people versus cars, because uh, there are extreme um, uh, cost constraints, uh, costs around building more parking, especially um, you know, parking that's in a garage or underground, or um, anything that's a structured parking, or uh, even building at grade uh, parking challenges how much housing you can build and how many how many families that you can serve, uh, and then also building housing in a, in urban areas um, like San Jose or some of the major cities close to transit where you may have a smaller site or a site with other site constraints um, really challenges how you can build part parking and drives the costs up. So when you have requirements from zoning codes and land use regulations dictating how much parking you have to build, it's really challenging. It, it truly is a give and take between how many homes you can provide and, and building parking spaces. And studies have shown, uh, the research shows that lower income folks are the vast majority of transit users in Santa Clara County and are less significantly less likely to own a car. And so when building housing for folks who are low income or very low income or extremely low income, we really do have an argument for building um, more housing so that folks can have relief uh, more affordable housing so they can have relief on their budgets when they're trying to share um, whatever their income is between housing expenses and other expenses that are required uh, to live uh, successful lives. 
and um, and owning a car, which is an expense in and of itself. We we like to incentivize folks with building less parking to not feel like they need to own a car and be closer to transit um, and have transit access. That's one of the reasons why First Community Housing actually provides um, a transit pass in Santa Clara County for every resident that it serves so that there's a huge incentive to use public transit. Um, there's no cost to the resident because it's a free transit pass for everyone in that home. And then there is um, the ability to sort of let go of your car or your vehicle if you have one and be able to rely on public transportation. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that people with uh, disabilities, seniors with supportive services um, and other folks like that actually are even more um, less likely to drive at all. And so folks who we're serving who may be vulnerable um, to being unhoused or being displaced who have uh, special needs are even more likely to not need a car. And so therefore um, a lot of affordable housing serving those populations um, significantly reduce their parking requirement, uh, which makes a lot of sense to be able to build more housing in and not have to build parking for folks who, who don't drive at all. And so there, there's been a wide recognition um, of this within our space. And so um, parking is sort of um, in practice becoming less of a challenge for affordable housing developers because of density bonus laws and other public policy that allows for concessions and waivers from these requirements uh, that are uh, built into the zoning code for affordable housing units, especially those that are serving special needs population. And so in practice, it's been working. And, um, and we just want to continue to see more of that. From the perspective of an advocate, um, you know, there's a recognition at SV at home that zoning and land use regulation are really founded uh, on the legacy of racism, uh, exclusionary uh, practices, segregation. And so requiring some of, some of these land use regulations and zoning requiring more parking and, and not incentivizing uh, more homes is really something that we want to uh, dismantle from the structural nature of it. Um, you know, that is why we believe that parking minimums should be eliminated, recognizing that our zoning and land use system needs to completely be reimagined and restructured because of the fact that it's really created the inequity that we see today. And we also believe that parking maximums should be put in place in transit rich areas. Um, of course, you know, this is really uh, pushing us to invest more in um, you know, uh, areas that are, are transit rich um, and have great access to transit. But um, we really believe that focusing on sustainability um, and in incentivizing the use of transit is um, something that we should be doing uh, to make our, our communities more equitable um, and so that folks who are living in these areas can get to um, work and, um, and can access their jobs, the schools, the, the resources that they need to have um, successful lives and a high quality of life without owning a car and without um, you know, spending a lot of significant amount of time on the road. So we do believe that uh, policies that look to reduce parking and eliminate parking requirements um, are uh, looking through an equity lens and how we can create cities and mixed use areas and communities that are walkable, bikeable and less car dependent. Um, so we support specific plans, uh, urban village plans that really call to create those types of, of vibrant communities. Of course, um, planning for neighborhood mobility and um, making sure that, that folks can get to the transit um, is really important and it's essential to the, this work. 
because we have to practically think about, you know, whether or not um, people who are working and living in the Bay Area who are low income, who have less options, who want to get rid of their car, can really get to work um, safely and um, and access their jobs, you know, at, at the hours that they need to be able to do that. Um, so we think we should be thinking about, you know, not just eliminated parking, but thinking about mobility beyond cars. You know, again, walkable, bikeable streets and network, uh, bike parking, significantly more bike parking, looking at scooters and those systems and how folks can still access transit and get to their jobs and, and to their schools and such. And we also believe that affordable housing, more affordable housing helps support public transit networks because um, our residents are such high users of public transit. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, um, I think I will pass it on to Stuart. Well, thanks so much, uh, Regina and Zoe. And uh, um, zooming in here from Hawaii, no, I'm, it's just actually a uh, Hawaii background, uh, but I wish it was. That was uh, excellent. And, um, and, and I just want to point out that Regina uh, did great work at First Community Housing, uh, uh, really kind of uh, paving the way is a funny uh, way to put it, but but towards a lot of developments that that uh, were very low parking and had had these kind of alternatives. I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, put on a PowerPoint here uh, that uh, will just take you through some tools uh, for affordable uh, to make more affordable homes uh, and uh, and and to really get the amount of parking right. And when we say right, we still need to provide in many cases some parking, uh, but, but as you heard from uh, both Zoe and Regina, uh, we really need uh, to reduce it. And so, uh, uh, so my name is Stuart Cohen. I founded Transform in 97 and I was the executive director uh, until uh, 2019. Uh, and, and now I'm doing a range of things, but I'm senior policy advisor uh, for Transform. Uh, Transform works uh, from the local to the state level to make more affordable communities, uh, connected communities uh, through smarter transportation and land use policy. Uh, and um, when we started working on parking, it was 2002, we got a grant to look at uh, actually Silicon Valley and produced a report called Housing Shortage Parking Surplus. Uh, and this report uh, surveyed the different communities and at that time, almost all units, including multifamily, had to build 2.2 spaces per unit. It didn't matter if the units were for seniors. It didn't matter if they were for low-income folks because they were affordable units. Uh, didn't matter uh, if it was near transit and services. And it didn't matter if it was a studio and likely had one or two people in them. Uh, and the point two, for those of you who aren't deep into carbon policy, is typically for guests. Uh, and so uh, this was part of the reason multifamily housing wasn't happening uh, back in those days. Um, so we did an illustration that kind of showed uh, what, you know, this is actually fairly typical if you had a very large, large mid-rise, uh, this is on four acres uh, taken from a, you know, a real proposed development. 800 units uh, would have required about 1800 parking spaces. Now, this is our slide from back then. So this is under 20,000 of space for structured parking. It's about double that now. Um, so this garage in red would uh, cost about uh, $60 million. We wanted to create a program that would work with the community, with developers, with cities, uh, to say that if we did things right, if we uh, you know, gave credit for all of those things I mentioned, plus for adding on-site transportation strategies, uh, that uh, we could kind of create new models and help that to lead to better policy. Uh, and so uh, we created the Green Trip program and it basically supports developers and cities that wanna do this. They wanna not provide as much parking, but as you can see with the green, you're able to take uh, greatly reduce that in this example, 
by about you know half to 1.1 just by being near transit uh, and services in walkable area, and then by about another 0.4 uh, by adding a small amount of affordable housing. People in affordable housing drive 30 to 50 percent less, depending on the level of affordability, uh, as well as providing free transit passes and car share memberships. Um, and that's another way First uh, Community Housing has been a real pioneer. All of their buildings now uh, provide free transit passes. Uh, and um, I, let me, instead of that ugly infographic, let me uh, show you what it looks like on the ground. Uh, this is uh, a, a picture of one of the developments, uh, Arroyo Green, and uh, done by Midpen. Uh, with just 0.5 spaces per unit, you could see here they were able to fit in many more homes, including on the ground floor uh, over to the right, uh, as well as provide a child care center uh, uh, over there on the ground floor. That's become a real amenity for the community. Uh, and today, there are 48 of these green trip buildings built, and we go and certify them and testify that they can have this reduced parking. Uh, and in some ways, we want green trip to have to go out of business, right? Because of what Regina said, where smarter policy would push towards maximums uh, and push folks towards developments that were more like this. Uh, and uh, since 2008, uh, Green Trip has certified, as I mentioned, 48 of those homes. It has led to $29 million leading from private developers going to transit agencies to support more transit service and to support more transit ridership. Uh, so that's uh, one of the things that uh, kind of smarter parking policy can do. We wanted to bring these to scale though, and, and it was obviously too much to try to work one-on-one -on -one with every you know, development coming online. So Transform created two tools that can be really helpful uh, to developers and to community members who wanna advocate for this kind of smarter development. Uh, so I'm gonna show those off right now. Uh, I'm not going to go online to do it, but I'll just uh, show you screenshots of them. This one is uh, called the Parking Database. Uh, we got a grant from HUD uh, to survey 80 housing sites, uh, most of them affordable, uh, and uh, put it into this uh, relational database. You can see at the bottom here that out of all of uh, the spots that we looked at, 28% were unused. Um, in total, that was over a million square feet of space going towards empty, unutilized vehicle storage spots instead of housing. Uh, that was done at a cost of about $200 million uh, of wasted space. Uh, so there's a really great cost when we uh, don't get the parking right. Um, and this is, can be used by uh, developers uh, you know, or members to get similar type buildings to what you might be proposing or supporting and seeing what the parking utilization was in those areas. And you can sort by all of these buttons to get to really similar uh, developments. But in addition to this, we wanted something even more sophisticated that would show the greenhouse gas benefits, the, the reduction in driving, and exactly kind of how much parking you know, you might uh, put in uh, to a development. And so we created this uh, tool called the Green, Green Trip Connect. So let me just uh, show you that right now. Uh, with Connect, you go to any location uh, in California, uh, but, but only the Bay Area has the parking prediction component of it. Uh, you put in, if you want details about the building, otherwise it'll just assume it's gonna be an average multifamily building for your county. Uh, and you have a chance to put in some of those strategies that I talked about that actually reduce the amount of parking needed, reduce the amount of driving that happens. Uh, in this example, we took the 71 units, we put them into very low and extremely low uh, income housing, and we gave everybody a transit pass. The value of that is $70 a month, because that's down at VTA in San Jose. If you do some of these other things, especially unbundling for parking, uh, where it says, will there be a charge for parking? You can get even you know, much better results in terms of reduced uh, driving and parking need. But we'll just stick to this because it was an actual example. Uh, and 
the, what you have is a dashboard that keeps showing you uh, how you're doing on these indicators of driving greenhouse gases and parking spaces needed. And uh, if you see my cursor here on the right, if built in an average location in San Jose, this multifamily would have required 1.15 spaces. People would have been driving around 29 miles. But you could see that on the selected parcel, because it was walkable near services, it needed less. Once you added some of the affordable housing, it needed less. And then with the transit passes less. And so you're able to reduce by about 0.3 uh, the number of parking spaces that might typically be used. Uh, then uh, you could see here how it would reduce driving from a typical building by about 43%. And on the left, you could see that for a standard, a typical family there, 2.7 people, it would save about $2,500 uh, if they're using these transit passes. And compared to a municipal code of just 1.5 spaces per unit, it would save almost $2 million for the development. Now, the thing I wanna say about this is 0.85 is still a fair amount of parking. There are many ways to bring that down more. Uh, certainly one of them is with shared parking, uh, looking around to see if there are other uses nearby uh, that, uh, that can share the parking and other strategies that we can talk about. But there's other tools available that I just wanted to show. The private sector uh, is coming up with all kinds of tools for parking. Some of them that won't really help with policy, but I wanted to point out one that does. It's called Parkade. Parkade uh, has two benefits. It basically is a tool that can help building managers do unbundled parking. That's when you come in and instead of just having a reserved spot or two, you get to purchase your spot or rent it. If you don't, uh, very often, uh, that means you're able to spend less money than you would have on housing, uh, getting to save that money for people that don't own a vehicle or own only one. Um, and if you do want it, you get to basically pay you know, what, the, what the price should be for parking. But it's very difficult to administer. A lot of building managers do a bad job. It's often you end up with a lot of empty spaces because you don't even know what's being used. This systematizes it uh, and uh, results in a much more efficient system and mostly makes managers willing to unbundle. And when you unbundle, you can reduce the amount of parking you provide by about 15 to 20 percent because people don't want to pay for when they see the actual parking charge. You know, if it's bundled into the rent, so be it. But they'll give up their second car sometimes or sometimes will give up their first. Um, the other thing it does is it allows sharing of parking between residents and for guests who are coming. This, this might be for a, a resident looking uh, to be able to park there for five days, having, having a guest. And by getting rid of guest parking, you often can get rid of about 0.2 per unit, uh, as I had mentioned earlier. And uh, so it's another great savings. So anyway, we're looking to incorporate, spread the word about these kind of tools uh, that can uh, have a further impact. If you'd like to look at these uh, tools, the database and Green Trip Connect, you can just go to greenship.org. Uh, and here is my email if you'd like more information. Uh, so I'll leave that up for a minute. And uh, Zoe, I think you can take us away. All right. Thank you so much, Stuart and Regina. Those are both uh, very, very informative. And I think you know, we really agree that mobility needs to go well beyond cars and removing parking minimums is really just the beginning to increasing all our transportation options. And it's really incredible how clearly Green Trip lays out how much extra parking we really have, which just results in such a significant increase in the cost of housing in particular. Um, so we have a number of questions in the chat, but I also have a few questions uh, for you guys myself. And I'm curious, um, how can you know, like mobility and street management be addressed if we reduce the amount of parking? And maybe Stuart, I'll, I'll ask you this. Sure, um, well, th there's a few way that street management uh, is, is becoming uh, you know, a big issue because of deliveries, micro mobility, uh, and um, I didn't show them, but there is a growing number of tools uh, that can help with uh, street management uh, that uh, that basically can even make it dynamic, kind of what are parking spaces, what kind of on-street parking uh, and curb space can be used for. 
One of the most important ones, though, kind of that is being implemented around the region is residential parking permit programs. Uh, and uh, that's where you know, folks that live already in units there uh, typically pay 30 to $70 a month, uh, helps administer the program, uh, usually they're revenue neutral. And, and it makes sure that residents can find parking uh, you know, on their street. And what a lot of cities are doing now is making it that some new development that comes in is not eligible. Large multifamily developments are not eligible for that residential parking permit. Uh, and this way, if you reduce the amount of parking, you really want to get it right, right? Because there can't be all this spillover. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, so I would say these RPPs, as they're known, uh, are, are kind of one of the best ways. And, uh, and then finally, we've mentioned, uh, the, the transportation strategies like the transit passes, uh, but we need to go beyond that now. And with technology, we really can. There's a pilot project that's just launching in three cities now that Transform and MTC uh, are sponsoring Transform's implementing it with funding from the state cap and trade from polluters on greenhouse gases. And that's putting mobility hubs at affordable housing sites and making them available to the larger community. Uh, and so uh, at actually a, a first community housing site, Betty Ann Gardens, uh, and then in Oakland uh, by the Coliseum BART and in Richmond, uh, we're now starting up these electric vehicle sharing, uh, bike sharing, scooter sharing, and other things that the community asked for. We actually went in and said, what does the community want? And, and now kind of with this very large grant from CARB uh, are able to deliver that. So there's a suite of strategies. And, and that's just to say, if we start reducing the parking, it forces us to use that strategies and gets us into a positive cycle of affordability and sustainability instead of saying, oh, but we don't know how well they'll work. So let's keep dedicating all of this, you know, storage for cars. Um, anyway, lots of things we can do. Yeah, I, and I just want to mention I'm so appreciative to Stuart and Transform because of their leadership in this space. You know, when developers sort of look at a site and consider um, what they can build, who they can serve, um, what the community may look like, uh, we're we're looking for ways to build more housing and looking for ways um, also to be good neighbors to the communities that we're building those, those that housing in. So the goal is, is definitely to avoid you know, spillover and it's not to just uh, completely change um, the dynamics of that, of that community. It really is to house people while um, sort of incentivizing, creating good habits around um, you know, transportation and, um, and transit. And so when we have all of these transportation demand management strategies um, and we can learn about them and understand them and, and how to implement them and make them successful, um, that, that's like a key tool for us. That's, that's a resource that we want to use because we want to help our residents um, come into a community, not need their cars, again, cut that cost, but without, you know, really negatively impacting what's happening at, at the street, uh, the parking on the street. Yeah, and I think it's so important to really, you know, balance any, uh, any parking policy reform with, you know, transportation demand management strategies to really add more community benefits to, to the whole, to the whole community. Stuart, I see you are going to answer some of the questions in the chat live, so maybe we'll, uh, uh, bounce back and forth. Um, so besides, uh, Angela was asking, you know, besides ballet parking, what are other options are there in terms of mixed use sites to really, uh, you know, address the high demands of parking during the day, but less of a need after hours? Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, isn't the first answer, which is not, you know, too direct, is that we really need to have more shared parking uh, so that that gets built into codes and so that when you do go, you know, if you do have uh, areas like this that are near residential or other uses, they are allowed to share them. Uh, some of the things that uh, need to be done is uh, just parking 
cash out, which is uh, several, a lot of companies are doing it, and it's there's a weak statewide law uh, that kind of requires uh, you know these kind of mixed use sites uh, to basically charge for their parking, uh, and uh, and then that can be used uh, to kind of pay out uh, the people that are using it, and uh, and so so we need to do that. We also uh, um, involved in King County in Washington uh, as a way to revive some of the commercial areas that have been hit hard by that pandemic. They're actually giving out uh, transit passes for anybody that comes in uh, to their stores and buys something. And so we got very used to this in this country to having parking validation where you go and you buy something, and you get free parking. Um, but folks that want to shop and take transit are often stuck paying. Uh, and so this kind of turns it on its head. So we need a lot of these kind of strategies um, to to simply reduce the amount uh, of demand for parking spaces in these areas. The final thing I'd want to say is that if these areas had uh, the right to build other uses on their site, if if they had large parking lots were actually an asset that they can use, the unused spaces, and they could put on housing or they can have additional development, it would really change the incentive structure. Um, and so then it makes them want to do things like parking cash out. It makes it uh, you know, just much more um, economically feasible uh, to do the right thing. And so, so pushing for this actually in the housing element, having commercial zoning, uh, anything that has commercial zoning should be allowed to have housing built in it, at least certain, certain types of housing. Uh, and honestly, we should, uh, Buffy Wicks, Assembly Member Wicks, has a statewide bill right now that would allow that. And so that's another thing we can support. Oh, great. What, which bill is that? Oh, you want me to do numbers? I'll look it that's up. That's okay. Never mind. Never mind. I'll oh look it God. up too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we've, Greenbelt Alliance has been working on the ground in San Jose on uh, you know, the to get a, a parking policy reform ordinance in, in that city. And we've been leading a lot of the community engagement. And there's been, you know, a fair amount of concern that this parking, the parking policy reform can actually, you know, potentially, you know, hurt marginalized community or low-income communities because oftentimes they have to drive to their job or something like that. Um, when you know, like, what are your thoughts on whether this policy could, you know, could hurt uh, low income or marginalized communities? And maybe we'll start with Regina this time. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things we're, we're really pushing for at SVA at Home in our advocacy is more access um, and more development of affordable housing near jobs. So, you know, it's, it's, not just reform, it, there's no one reform that will solve, uh, again, the inequity that's sort of ingrained in um, our community right now. So we're looking to uh, really open up um, areas that have been exclusive, haven't seen a lot of uh, affordable housing developed in, in them to allow folks who are low income or very low income to live closer to jobs so that even if they're, they do need to drive, it's a shorter drive and it's really reducing the vehicle miles traveled, um, which is also um, increasing sustainability. We, we absolutely, I've heard the, the adage as well that you know we know that folks um, have a lot of challenges. They have um, you know, children, they have to get to school, they have to work perhaps multiple jobs, they have to spend a lot of time getting from one place to the other. And so it really is important for folks to have shorter distances that they have to travel. Um, and it may be that the transit in some of the locations that are, um, you know, marginalized communities, uh, a high population of BIPOC um, folks don't have as good transit and we need to invest more in transit, walkability, bikeability there. And so uh, it is challenging for for folks and they they are still relying on cars when when that's something we should be working on a systematic level to to reduce that reliance on cars. 
Yeah, I think we definitely need to, you know, work at that systematic level to, you know, increase our transit options and reduce reliance on cars. And, you know, as part of the, of the San Jose effort, we worked with uh, Latinos United for a New America, Luna, to produce like a parking and TDM report that really, you know, interviewed um, a number of East San Jose residents that showed that, uh, you know, many of whom were, you know, struggled to live uh, comfortably in San Jose due to high rent and living costs. That the majority of them really were supportive of these policies to remove parking minimums, but really were more excited about the transportation demand management possibilities. And in particular, you know, the provision of transit passes and other transit subsidies like bike lanes and those like micro mobility network improvements. So I think it's you know really important for these to go to go hand in hand. Um, Stuart, have there or is Parkade run by a private for-profit company? Yeah, it is, uh, and they, they're just about four years old, uh, but they're very mission-oriented, uh, and so it's a uh, it's a great. Uh, they're actually inspired by Green Trip Connect was one of their motivations kind of for doing this. But yes, they are. And then uh, there's somebody that says uh, Green Trip seems like an incredible tool to calculate how much parking we have. But as an advocate, you know, how can I use this to advocate for less parking in my community? Yeah, that question is a really good one, as well as the one below it by Colin. And I'll kind of answer them in tandem, tandem starting with Colin's. Um, and, you know, he, Colin says, uh, how do you avoid the induced demand problem? So basically, if we provide no parking or almost no parking, people won't have their vehicles and then they'll drive less. And uh, so, you know, that is uh, absolutely correct. And we have very few buildings with zero parking uh, and uh, some of the very, very old buildings. So we have a deficit of those with zero parking. I think a lot of cities um, can uh, put in uh, spots that maybe have zero to five spots for staff or something and, and be able to do it because you could just attract that car-free crowd. Right now, that car-free crowd has to go to places that have spots and are often bundled into their lot. So, so it's a great point. However, the vast majority of people, unfortunately, in our society still own vehicles. Uh, and uh, in San Jose, just as an example, only 5% of the population is car-free. And so at some point, uh, you know, we're not able to build car-free buildings. We, we could build a bunch of them, but at some point we have to then get people to give up their vehicles first because uh, developers at, at some point won't be able to just forever, you know, build that zero and find the people for it. And, and to some extent, you know, banks now finance those, but, uh, but it could still be tricky if you try to go to a zero, especially luxury, it's very hard to go to a zero and get it financed. Um, and then as an advocate uh, to use, uh, there's a couple of ways to use this in your community Green Trip Connect. The first one that we're really encouraging folks to do now is as part of the housing element campaign. Zoe mentioned housing elements. Every uh, jurisdiction in the Bay Area is going through that process now. Some have just released their drafts. Very few of them deal with parking well. They're supposed to look at it as a constraint on housing, um, but most of them seem to just be saying, ah, it's not such a big constraint, or maybe we'll deal with it at some point down the road, but we're not gonna give a date for doing that. With this, you can go onto some of their proposed sites because they have a kind of a site analysis that they do. And you can show by pressing a lot of those buttons, adding affordability, putting in unbundling and reducing the amount of parking that's uh, provided, how much less driving uh, and uh, how, you know, GHGs uh, and how much re residents and developers can save. And then you can show that to the planners, to the city council and say, look, you know, uh, just from this one site where I had a lot of time and I looked at all 47 sites in our community, uh, and this is what we can do with smarter policy. Um, so so uh, we're, feel, feel free to contact me. We've been doing trainings on that to community groups. And the other way is on a one-by-one -one development uh, basis where you go to a developer that's looking at 1.5 or two spaces per unit, and you use it to advocate um, for uh, a reduction in the amount of parking they provide. And what I'd add to that is um, you can also as a part of uh, work in the housing element, um, ask cities and municipalities to prioritize the, the residential development along transit, transit routes. So really, um, 
you know, proposing um, development that is close to transit that will incentivize folks to take transit and not um, remove from that from that access to that resource. Yeah, and I think this is, you know, probably the most exciting housing element cycle. It happens every eight years, but, but the most exciting cycle that there ever has been due to the, you know, combination of both the climate and housing impacts that we're facing. And the housing element really is this, you know, clear, tangible way that we can, you know, make substantial changes in our communities. And the parking policy in particular really is, you know, this like clear, tangible thing that advocates on the ground can can push for and, and really can make it make a difference. And so I know I already said this, but if you're not involved in your housing element process, you know, definitely get involved and definitely advocate for, um, you know, both a reduction in parking minimums and also, you know, increased transportation demand management strategies and more housing, you know, near, near jobs and transit. Um, I just add, so, and Greenbelt Alliance yeah. is very engaged in a lot of those. So get in touch, you know, with Zoe, if you want to figure out how to plug in. Transform's going to be putting out a parking policy catalog so you could uh, kind of better advocate for these kind of changes. Yeah, and if you're not sure which policies you really want to push for in the housing element, Greenbelt Alliance also released a uh, an online tool called the Resilience Playbook, which has a whole catalog of possible policies, including parking policy and many others uh, related to these issues. So I will put that a link to that in the chat as well. I think we have time for perhaps just one more question. Um, and I, this is sort of a, you know, a larger, more, more open-ended question, but I like to, you know, conclude webinars on, on an inspiring note. Um, and I'm curious for both of you, you know, what are you most excited about, you know, related to, you know, both parking policy and, you know, you know, transportation and housing um, issues right now? Maybe Regina, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that's a, a good question. I think that right now we are, there's a, a policy called affirmatively furthering fair housing. And um, I think there's a, a lot that we can do around making sure that, um, that we're building housing closer to jobs, closer to, to transit, and that, um, that we understand that, that there is an ability to really change the way um, our cities and our communities look and feel. And so um, looking at it through that lens, I feel more empowered. I feel like there's a lot of momentum that's, uh, you know, from, from the community, community-based, community-led momentum um, around seeing change and um, investing more into um, housing and housing infrastructure and not into um, uh, car storage or parking. Great, right. Stuart. And for me, the most exciting thing is that uh, Professor Donald Chup was on this call uh, and uh, he's the guru uh, nationally of parking policy. But I'd say that we're seeing this play out now, this smarter policy on the ground, right? This was uh, uh, Professor Shoup's idea, you know, 20 years ago and longer now. And uh, we're seeing places like Los Angeles, San Diego, that uh, like in San Diego, they got, you know, got rid of their parking policies downtown and they're getting this huge surge in housing now uh, and including a huge surge of affordable housing that is now uh, able to uh, kind of more, uh, uh, you know, more affordably be built uh, without that, especially in a downtown where you typically have to go underground and it gets very expensive. Um, and in transportation policy, you know, it's it's a little bit slow, but I have to say the movement for uh, kind of better bicycle and pedestrian facilities is part and parcel of all of this. You can't expect people to take transit. You can't expect them to get out of their cars, um, you know, if it's if it's tough and and yeah, yes, you're in San Jose biking around and getting these protected lanes uh, is essential. Uh, and, you know, we just got so used to it being dangerous to do anything but uh, kind of drive. And so, uh, so, so really excited about the whole bike ped movement. 
yeah, I think all of that is very exciting. And then, you know, on this call, in addition to shoot, I find it really exciting how many environmental advocates really are, you know, advocating for these kids housing and transportation policy solutions as well. You know, Greenbelt Alliance really works at the intersection of, you know, both housing and, and uh, environmental advocacy. And it's really incredible how many environmentally focused people are, are on this call or, or people that really, you know, are coming at this work, you know, from a, you know, open space climate preservation uh, perspective. And the, it's really clear that, you know, we all see this critical role that, you know, utilizing our land um, for, you know, housing and transportation while protecting our open spaces, you know, is the shared goal that we can really all get behind. And I think it's a really exciting movement, mo mo moment for, for these, you know, shared climate and, and housing movements that are really, you know, joining, joining forces. And I think this webinar is a clear, uh, clear uh, showing of that. And so, yeah, it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much to Stuart and Regina for, you know, sharing your wisdom with us. Um, and as many of you know, Greenbelt Alliance, Transform, and Silicon Valley at Home are all local nonprofit organizations, and we would not be here without your support. Um, we really appreciate your interest in this webinar, and please uh, definitely look at the Silicon Valley at Home website. There's all sorts of other uh, Affordable Housing Month webinars happening, and uh, stay tuned for the next webinar from uh, Greenbelt Alliance, Transform, and Silicon Valley at Home. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Thank everyone. You all.